welcome. <clears throat> welcome to God Talk. This is Pastor Dan. I've uh, <clears throat> been having some trouble with the allergy, but uh, <clears throat> let's see if we can get through this and get a message out. And I'm excited about what I want to say. I don't think you'll hear this from, from anyone else right now today in our church. This is uh, an angle that I think is fairly unique to, to me. And uh, let's see what you think when we're done today. We're doing a series of three weeks that are from a Character of God conference we had. You know this is God Talk. We talk about God. And uh, we brought, boy, at the peak, we had a couple hundred people there <clears throat> at my Garden Grove Church. And we did Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then finished Sunday morning and brought guests in. People gave money, and we had a great time. There were some dramatic moments, and, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, I wish, I wish you could have been there if you care about the character of God. So <clears throat> even though I was not the guest, I was just one of the pastors there, uh, I did have two or three of the messages there. And so I'm doing these three from that, from that Character of God conference. And these are sort of my, my brand, my, my themes. I preach on all kinds of topics all over the world. But at the core of, <clears throat> of my character of God, these are key ideas. You've heard the story from Rwanda. Back in 1994, there was this uh, tribal conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis, a million people died, three months. They say that a group of soldiers broke into a Sunday church service one time with machine gun, made them all lie down. <clears throat> and then he saw a picture of Jesus on the wall. And he said, you have to go over there and you have to spit on the picture and say, this is, you, you are useless. I want nothing more to do with you or you'll die today. Pastor didn't want to die. <laughs> Goes over, spits on the picture. You get the story. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, you are useless. I want nothing more to do with you. Head elder, <clears throat> deacon, different people. Finally, uh, after seven or eight, one young girl, 13, 14, went over there, took her skirt, wiped it all off, and said, Jesus, I am the one who was useless. I will never give you up. Went over to the soldier and says, you can, you can kill me now, but I won't give him up. Soldier began to cry, put his cap on the girl. I can't kill anybody willing to die for their faith. Here at the core of Christianity is this story about this symbol, which we have here, the cross. And we use it and we wear it and we hang it in our churches and we have it on our TV show. What does it mean? We talked last week a little bit about some of the questions and the problems. Why did Jesus have to die? Is God the kind of God like those soldiers who said, do this or you will die? When we look at the empires, we've talked about this before. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, everyone destroyed the empire before and became the new empire through violence. You destroy one kingdom to build your own kingdom. Does Jesus do that when he is the rock cut out without hands and comes down and smashes, it says, all the other kingdoms of the world? Is Jesus and God really just one more empire that uses violence? And instead of destroying another empire, God destroys his own son. Is that what's going on at this signature moment of our faith? That God kills his own son in our place. Is that the best we can do? And as I told you last week, I began to struggle with those questions, began to wrestle with what happens at the tree in the Garden of Eden. When God says, if you eat of the tree, you will surely die, the traditional model is God hates sin, he's offended by sin, heartbroken by sin, and somebody has to die, comes from the feudal lords back in the thousand years ago, is that there was blood honor if you said something or did something against one lord, 
his knights were honor bound to go over there and do something to satisfy the offended honor. And Anselm, the great uh, priest, wrote a famous book and he said, that's what Christ had to do. Sin offends the honor of God and Jesus died to satisfy the offended honor of God. It's called the satisfaction model. Sometimes called the legal model, forensic model, objective model, all these theological terms. Another priest, Abelard, went the other way. He said, no, God doesn't care about his honor. Not the problem, not in the heart of God. The problem is in our heart. We have lost our feeling and perception of the love of God. What to do? Catholic priest announced one morning, come back tonight, we'll have a sermon on the love of God. Church was full, turned off the lights and with a lamp. He went up to the crucifix, hung the lamp by the wounds and the feet, and then hung the lamp by the wound in the side. And then he raised the lamp up to where the nail prints were in his hands, the crown of thorns. And they say that the whole church began to cry, the love of God. Is the cross for God to see, or was the cross for the people to see? To fork on the road, the continental divide. When I was a young pastor, there was an article by a young man named Mark Ford in the, uh, I think, in the Insight magazine for young people. Boy, it made me think. He said there was a young couple, fell in love, handsome, beautiful. And they were going to the point where it was about ready, he was ready to ask her. He invites her to go on a date. They drive up into the mountains. They come around the corner, and here was a castle. And he said, if we should get married, we'll live here. This is my house. You have a castle? No. Wow, she's ready to say, yeah, no, let me show it to you first. They go to every room. It's amazing. If they could live here, she will be... Here in this house with him, she's ready to say yes. He said, wait a minute, I'm going to show you one more thing. Takes her out behind the house. Here's a fresh grave. And he, he says, uh, this is my first wife. You were married before? Yes, it's Mary. He said, uh, we were the best couple. Everyone thought we were the magic, magic couple. We would be happy forever. But as we began to live, I began to sense that she was drawing away from me. I tried everything to win her, keep her with my side. I gave her gifts. I took her on vacation. I, gave her, I did everything. But finally, I could tell she was going to leave. I didn't know what else to do. Couldn't bear it. So I did what I had to do. I, I, I killed her, buried her here. Now you know everything about me. I know you'll never... Do that to me. I love you. He kneels down, brings out a ring, and says, Would you marry me? <laughs> That's the parable that Mark wrote. Is God the kind of God who kneels down in front of us in Genesis 3 and says, I love you. Will you marry me? But if you don't, I'll kill you. And the old line was, love me or I'll kill you. Is that what it is? The old cartoon of Garfield, to be my valentine or I'll break your arm. <laughs> no good. What kind of God is God? We forgive. My boys made mistakes. We didn't demand that they go kill some animal and bring it to us and offer it as a sacrifice. And then we'll forgive. We just forgave. Told the story, when Hilda and I got engaged, went over to my parents' house, we told them. I said, don't tell Grandma and Grandpa because I can't go today. We got to go in a few days. Next day, my father called me. He said, Dan, too late. Mom already told Grandma and Grandpa. I called my mother. Why did you do that? That was, our, that was our story to tell, not yours, Mom. I'm sorry. Two days later, I got a check in the mail for $100. I called my mother. Why did you send me money? I oh, just, Sorry. I said, Mother, I forgave you. You don't have to pay me. 
anything in order for me to forgive. But somehow we have the idea that God needs something in order to forgive. He has to be pacified, appeased, and so on. Jephthah. Back in Judges 11, Jephthah was a child of a prostitute. His family didn't want him. He represented a bad story in their family's life. But he was tough and he was good in the military and war. When the country was in trouble, they came to get him out of the woods and they said, you be our governor, you lead us, you'll be our general, we'll follow you. And Jephthah's not sure that God will bless him. He's the son of a prostitute. Their army is much smaller than the army that has surrounded them. So he goes out in the woods and he prays to God. He said, God, if you'll just bless me, give us a victory. We need your blessing. And if you will bless me and this army, whatever comes out my door when I get home, I'll give you that. They have a great victory. He's come dancing with his men up the sidewalk and they're happy and celebrating. The door opens and here comes his only daughter. Hug her father. And he remembers the vow that he had made. And it says, he told her of the vow. She wanted two months with her own girlfriends. And then he said, it did to her as he had vowed. It's a terrible story. You can imagine how God in heaven leans down and says, that's how all the other cultures around you think about God, that God has to have a sacrifice in order to, but you know me, I am not like that. You do not have to give a sacrifice in order for me to bless you. But Christian theology and most pagan religions still have the idea that God will not bless you unless you give them something to persuade them to shift their vote from no to yes. Be careful. So we have to decide is this a problem is with God or with man? When we sin, does something have to be done to change the mind and heart of God or does something have to be done to change the mind and heart of man? Where does this price have to be paid and who is the price paid to? The old question the reformers wrestle with. J.I. Packer, wonderful theologian. I don't know if he's still alive. He's got to be very old now, but he wrote one time, one sentence that I had a hard time with, he said, when Jesus died, God changed his vote, switched his vote from no to yes. It sounds right. But that means that God's vote was no when we sinned. And that our cross, Jesus died to do something to God. So Jesus has already said yes. He's willing to die, but he has to die to get to God to change. So Jesus changes to yes before God. So another not together. And that means is that if you sin, God switches the vote from yes to no. And that is not unconditional love anymore. But God says, I will never change. Malachi 3, 6. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And Romans 8, 38 and 39. I give these three over and over again. Nothing separates you from the love of God. So is Christianity really not much different than all the other pagan religions? And when you sin, you make the gods mad and you have to do something to change the God, to pacify him, appease the God, satisfy God, convince God, change God in some way. Or are the we the ones who left? Did God go away? Did the gods go away? And you have to persuade them to come back? Or do we leave and God has to bring us back? 2 Corinthians 5, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And as I said in the last program, I didn't want to give up substitution. The Bible is pretty clear. Isaiah 53 has what? A 10 or 11 different references. Put our iniquities upon himself. Took our sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Christ died for our sins. Substitution. It's at the core of my faith. How to find a doctrine of substitution that did not separate God and Jesus. Jesus says, we are the same. I and the Father are one. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. I could not have them apart. And I couldn't have the Father conflicted. Part of him wants to love and save everybody. Part of him wants to punish, destroy everybody who has sinned. And Jesus has to reconcile this conflict within God. 
I am willing to say that God is complex, but I'm not willing to say that he has two natures within him that are contesting and that Jesus Christ has to do something to change God. I worry about our doctrine of mediation, that our mediation, we have to say, Jesus has to protect us from God. One theologian, pastor in uh, Orange County, has an umbrella illustration. God is raining down wrath, and Jesus Christ is our umbrella to shelter us from the wrath of God. I said to a man who was going there, do you believe that? That Jesus and the Father are on different sides of this? And Jesus protects us from the Father? That's the best we can do? That's our gospel that we offer to the world? How is that different from all the other pagan religions? So we have to wrestle with this. And I will just say, it seems to me that God in Jesus Christ is not trying to do something for God to see, but to change us. That in the garden, when Jesus took all of our sins, and now he cannot find God. God did not go anywhere. God did not change. God is either the same forever. Even though Jesus Christ is the worst sinner in the history of the world because he's taken all of our sins and the guilt of them all. God doesn't change. He's right there. Jesus can't feel God, can't find God. God is there. And Jesus, now that he's taken our sins, what happens to him? Does God kill him or does God let him experience the natural consequences? In Matthew 27, 46, Jesus does not say, my God, my God, why are you killing me? He says, why have you forsaken me? He's just letting sin play out. And what happens with sin? You die. Sin will kill you. My cousin Gary Venden, we were at camp meeting last summer. Same theology. He said, sin is lethal. Jesus died to show the world sin is lethal. He's our substitute. I tell my boys, when they were going through high school, I said, look at other people's mistakes. You don't have to learn from your mistakes. Learn from other people's mistakes. They are your substitute. Those boy and the girl, the great athletes at our school, they got a baby, wrecked their lives for a while. Are happy that little baby, he's a good kid. But look at that hardship those two people have to do now. So you do not have to have a baby to learn that having a baby is hard when you're 17 years old. Learn from them. And Jesus says, please, learn this from me. The sin will separate you from God and you will eventually die. I don't want you to die to learn. You can't learn anything when you've died. Learn from me. It's a revelatory substitution. I've used many different models. I've used sharks. You go diving with the sharks. We're in a shark cage, and the second dive, they said, let's dive without the shark cage. We don't want any more bars on our pictures. So let's say we're going to jump in, and uh, the instructor says, you got crazy. Don't do that. You will surely die. The sharks will kill you. No, we think we'll throw some meat over there, and the sharks will go over there. Teacher doesn't know what else to do. Grabs the tank, and he jumps in the water. And in three seconds, those sharks are all over him. And there's blood and flesh everywhere. And we grab him back on the boat. He dies. Nobody dives. They learned. Substitute. They learned something. Sharks will kill you. Sin is lethal. You go through all the Bible and you ask, who needs to see something here? When Jesus died, the veil ripped from top to bottom. Did the veil rip so that the God in the most holy place can now see out and see something he could not see before? Or did the veil rip because now we can look in and see something about the Father and the throne in the most holy place that we couldn't see before? Everyone tells me it's for us to see, not for God to see out. Revelation 3, verse 20. I grew up with the idea God's inside heaven. You're knocking on the door and he looks out to see and decide if you and I are good enough to let into his heaven. And that's not what Jesus says. He says, we're inside. He said, I am knocking, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And God is waiting to see, for us to look out and see if God is the kind of God we want to be in our lives forever. God wants us to see. 
John 14, 9. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What did Jesus want us to do? See the Father. John 1, 18. No one has seen God except the Son who is at the Father's side has made him known for us to know the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The blind man. Jesus heals the blind man, and they come and say, who did this? He said, uh, you go talk to him. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The light of the world is for us to see. God already knows the light. He lives in the light. We are the ones in the darkness, and he lives the light. He said, we will say, I was blind, but now I see. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of men. We live in darkness. But he said, The God who created the world and created light has now sent us light in the face of Jesus. And so that we can see the light of the world. We have seen the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The prodigal son. Did Jesus tell this story so that the father could see something new about the son? Or did the son need to see something about the father? What is the truth Jesus wants us to know? And everyone tells me it's for us to know the truth about the father. That's why Jesus told this story. Brian McLaren, a great pastor, Washington, D.C., for many years, came here and spoke at Loma Linda one time. I got to go. Wrote an article about Hosea. Hosea did what they called an acted parable. He's just a pastor prophet in Israel. God comes down and says, go find that prostitute and you marry her. I have to marry her? You know who she is? Yes. Goes and hits her, has a child with her. She goes back to prostitution. Boy. Get out of that as quick as you can. God says, go get her back. Goes and gets her back, another child, three children. It's an acted parable, but God says, this is what I do with you. I bring you in. I love you. You cheat on me. Prostitute yourself. I bring you back. It's an acted parable. What's the purpose of the story? For Israel to learn a truth about God, that God will keep taking you back. And God hopes someday you will stay home and be faithful to him. Revelation 14, 144,000 have not been with women. They are monogamous with God. And Brian McLaren said, as we wrestle with the cross, could it be that the cross is an acted parable? It is not something to pacify and appease God. But God goes through this acted parable and he puts all our sins on Jesus and Jesus dies not to convince God to satisfy the offended honor of God, but for us to see the truth of this God who will go to any lengths to save us. You decide. And then I read in Steps to Christ, a wonderful book by Ellen White. And there are two pages in Steps to Christ. So I have circled 11 Visual words. Jesus died to what? Show us. Manifest. So that we would know, understand, perceive, aware. All visual words. Jesus died not for God to see something new about us. To change the mind and heart of God. But to change the mind and heart of us back to God. You go to Revelation 4 and 5, we've preached here. The choir gets bigger when the 24 elders and the four are living creatures see the cross. They sing, you are worthy. When all the angels see, you are worthy as a lamb. When the whole world sees, you are worthy. The cross is for us. And after I thought I was pretty smart and had figured all this out, it was in Steps to Christ, page 13 all along. This great sacrifice was not made in order to create in the Father's heart for man 
to make him willing to save. No, no, God so loved the Son that he gave his Son. The Father loves us not because of the great propitiation, but he provided the propitiation because he loves us. Christ was the medium through which he could pour out his infinite love upon a fallen world. Cross is for us. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. Cross is for us. The old Chinese legend, one of my favorite stories all over the world, I've told it, about the uh, family whose house burst into flame the parents ran out, the older children ran out, but they're horrified to look upstairs. Here was the children, little children, playing with their toys. The father's beside himself. He yells till the children jump. The house is on fire. Little kids, oh, we don't see any fire. We're playing with our beautiful toys. No, the house is on fire. You have to jump. You die. No, we don't see any fire. We don't want to jump. Father, what shall we do? What shall we do? The house is burning. Can't go back in. Father finally shouts out again. He said, if you would jump, Daddy will buy you bigger toys, better toys, more wonderful toys. Just jump, we'll catch you. Then the kids jumped. And maybe we haven't won the world to the degree that we wanted to win them. We haven't told the story of the cross that made God look very good. We could tell this great story of the cross, but if we tell it in a way that makes God look terrible and no better than all the gods of all the other religions, why should they convert to this? God is a God who says, do this or you will die, like those soldiers of Rwanda. We, I'm sure, don't fully understand the cross yet, we're told we will study throughout eternity of a thousand years to ask for the full understanding. But maybe we can grow a little closer to move the focus away from trying to win over an offended God, but a heartbroken God trying to win his people back to him. And he said, I'm knocking on the door. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And may you and I tell the story of the cross in such a way that we win people back to God. And people will say, I was blind, but now I see.